Hey, is anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord today? I need you to open your Bible very quickly to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter number 39. And uh, I want to get into the word of the Lord today, because if I'm going to put all the chrome <clears throat> and all the, what do you call those things where you don't hit the curb? Yeah, those things too. I'm not sure what that man just said about me. <laughs> but I am glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Count it an honor to be here with everybody. And uh, want the Lord to have his way in this place. My, what preaching we have heard. Now, I could save you all a whole bunch of time today just by reading my text to giving you a coupon for all the CDs. I walked over Brother Miles Young last night when he got done. I said, either you really help me or yeah, I'm, I'm going to hate your guts. And then I, I was still a little nervous. Brother Mooney got downstairs this morning talking at the breakfast. <clears throat> And uh, he took all the nervousness away. That's a bad thing. But I, uh, I so appreciate what was said, not only in these services, but during the breakfast this morning. Uh, it counted an honor to be here with this great church, incredible heritage of Calvary Tabernacle, the ministry that's here, the ministry that's gone before me. Of course, Brother Jones tonight, the host pastor, Brother Mooney. Give honor to him. Uh, I love Brother Mooney. I'm telling you, the man is a force to be reckoned with in the eyes of hell when it comes to this doctrine. Thank God for people that still love doctrine. Yeah, admire him so much. You know what my, my daughter likes about him? My daughter likes his hair. I said, boy, he, he's, he's a preacher. He's, he's a, she said, I like his hair. Well... I'm not going to talk a whole lot about hair today. He's got that tall, dark, and handsome look. I got that orangutan on steroids look. <clears throat> of course, give honor to everybody. Thank you for being here. I, I want to do two things. I want to give honor to my pastor today. Very sick. He's from Indiana. Bishop Robert Johnson is my pastor. Very, very sick, just coming out of a lengthy sickness, 50 some odd days in the hospital. I love him. He is my hero. And of course, my precious, precious family is here today, my wife and daughter anyway, and my mother-in-law. Now, Calvary would know my mother-in-law as Sister Barbara Harris. Just a few weeks ago, we buried my incredible father-in-law, and I can tell you today that that man taught me more about valuing the unerring word of God than anybody I've ever been around in my life. And I certainly want to give honor to her today. I'm reading from the book of 1 Samuel, <clears throat> chapter number 31. Hopefully you'll pray for my voice today because it's not really good. 1 Samuel, chapter number 31. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost today. Anybody feel like having a little bit of church? Now, I don't know exactly about all this day speaker type situation here in my Am I supposed to just get up here and cruise through a message? And I always feel sorry for the first guy, Brother Brosom, incredible. Even you got on what I want to say. But, but I, I, I love it. I feel sorry for the first guy because you get there. You, it's kind of like being on your, your date and you puck her up for the first kiss and she turns her head at the last second. <clears throat> I hate when that happens. Not, not that I have many first dates anymore, baby. Just... 1 Samuel, chapter number 31, verse number 9, said, And they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. My message tonight for your... Consideration will be from the 10th verse. I have two titles tonight. <clears throat> Today, I, uh, I have two different uh, ways, perhaps, of expressing what I want to say. I'd like to title it, Don't Leave Your Armor in the House of Ashtaroth. But I think it might be easier for you to remember 
If I just preach today how to know you've lost the war. How to know you've lost the war. Anybody going to help me preach today? Clap your hands to the Lord one more time and love him. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm here today to preach to the greatest spiritual organism on the face of the earth. Only a fool would ignore the fact that when it comes to God's plan in this present world, that there is no greater force than God's church. When you strip away all the religious facade, all of the ritualistic religions, all of the self-indulgent spirituality, the truth is there is nothing on the face of this earth more equipped or more able to stand against the carnality of this world. There's nothing more equipped to stand against the sinfulness of humanity or the iniquity of this age than the church of the living God. I, I get a little bit worried sometimes that we as the church reach the place that we feel like we've been hurled into a vicious world without a weapon in our hands, but that's simply not the truth. I think it's of the utmost importance that you realize that God has placed all of his earthly ambitions into this precious, priceless, peculiar thing that we call the church. And you might as well know tonight that God has invested some great things in the church, things for which the adversary has absolutely no recourse. I need to tell you today that God has put things in the church that cannot be undone or ignored by hell itself. Do I need to tell this church today that God has placed in us the power of truth and all of hell cannot stop the truth from setting you free. God has placed in the church a revelation of the oneness and the Bible said even the devils believe in that. And they tremble. Thank God for the revelation of the oneness God has placed within this church. So many things that we need and that we cherish. God's placed worship in the church. And the strongest of demons cannot stop your worship from touching the throne. God has placed the power of the preached word in the church and that can pierce through every hindering spirit and reach to the depths of every soul. Now, I've just got to be honest with you today before I get too into this tonight. I've got to tell you, I need to open my heart up about some things that, that's been troubling me lately. It's simply in my very heart to tell you that I'm almost a little troubled over some faithless attitudes in what's supposed to be a faithful church. First of all, we, and by we I mean the church, make a grave mistake when we let life round about us tell us that it is not the will of God for the church to be blessed and to prosper. And no, I'm not some prosperity preacher, but I'm also not a poverty preacher. I believe that God wants to bless his people. I don't believe that God threw us into a building somewhere and said, I want you to just eke out an existence for the rest of your life. Tell, I want to tell somebody today, God wants to bless, and we're not going to be blessed in a lot of areas until we start believing that God desires to bless the church. The second thing that God's been whispering to me lately is that far too many of our people are trapped in what I, they're victims of what I call rescue me reasoning. They simply live their life powerless against the enemy. And the only hope they have is that some preacher, some sermon, some special service will come by about once every two weeks and pick them up before they're completely annihilated by the adversary. Where in the world did that spirit come from? Have we forgotten that the Bible said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Somebody in this house today understand the church is not powerless and we are not pitiful. We are not unequipped and we are not unarmed. We are not unprepared and we are not incapable. I'm just going to tell somebody here today you might as well get this in your spirit. When you started this journey some of you walked into it knowing that it's going to be a fight from the very beginning. You didn't walk into the church expecting it to be a bed of roses. Some of you walked into the church knowing full well 
you are going to have to fight the devil over the temptations he would put in your way. You are going to have to fight your flesh over the habits you acquired in your sin. You are going to have to fight your family that wouldn't understand the change in your lifestyle. You are going to have to fight your past to rise above the mistakes you made in your yes. Oh, come on now. If you've got to be honest here today, you were not remotely blindsided by the battle. You knew that it was going to come. But you walked to that altar anyway saying, I don't care what i got to pay. I don't care what it's going to cost me. I'm going to fight my way to a relationship. <laughs> you walk to the altar with an understanding. I'm going to fight my way into a relationship. Oh, somebody in here help me preach tonight. I'm going to tell you, you walked into it because you knew that God, and you knew it was going to be a battle because you understand that God's got a way of reaching for those who know how to fight. I feel like preaching about fighting a little bit here today. I hope I can say this the way it needs to be said today. You need to understand that God calls fighters into the church because if you're not a fighter, you're not going to make it in the church. If we ever understand that, you'll look at scriptures totally different. For instance, the Bible tells us that if we're going to live for God, we've got to be ready to endure hardness as a good soldier. He didn't say into it like some weak need sissy. He said if you're going to live for God, you've got to endure hardness as a good soldier. You've got to get a soldier's mentality that said I was called into this arena of spiritual activity because I got something in me that knows how to stand up and fight. God never told you to endure abuse like some whipped down excuse for a Christian. He said stand back up and keep on fighting. Take hell's best shot and jump back up in the devil. I wonder if there's anybody in this place who's still got a warrior spirit that knows what it's like to still stand shoulder to shoulder with your brother and sister and fight, fight, fight. Somewhere along the line we got to realize Oh, I want to preach. Lift your hands up and love the Lord right now. God, help my voice. I want to preach today. Please listen to me. We better look at the Word of God and remember that it was God and God alone that inspired holy men of old to write in your Bible about such things as take unto you the whole armor of God. And then he tells us in the book of Corinthians, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strong. Don't forget that it was he and he alone that proclaimed in 1 Timothy this charge. I commit unto thee, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before thee, that by them thou mightest war a good. And then God said, just in case you forgot, I'm coming back five chapters later. And when you forget what you knew in the beginning, I've got to tell you again, to fight the good fight of faith. And then to belabor the point, he comes back in the very, very next epistle. And he said, I'm going to tell you, don't lose the fight just because you got weary. Don't lose your ability to war just because you got distracted. I know you've lived some life, but don't lose your focus. Keep on fighting. No man that warreth entangleth himself again with the affairs of this world that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. God gave them one of the most important revelations that you could ever get. You don't entangle yourself with the world. Not because we're scared to death. The devil's going to snatch you out of the church. You don't do that because God called you to fight. And you can't fight when you're wrapped up in the spirit of the world. And you can't fight when you're wrapped up with the attitudes of the world. One of the greatest revelations we better get is that God called us to fight we better get a revelation again that God called us
Jesus. I just got to tell you today, don't get so wrapped up in the world is what he said that you forget that I called you to fight. He didn't choose you because you were so pretty. He didn't choose you because you were so impressive. He didn't choose you because of your illustrious eloquialisms. He chose you because you were a fighter. I want to make it painfully clear to this congregation today. In the midst of our screaming and shouting. In the midst of our preaching and praying. In the midst of our reaching and revelation. At the end of the day you better know this one thing. He called you to fight. Oh I know that we are in a spiritually enlightened day. There's all kinds of theologies that tell us why we don't have to be so passionate but God help us to remember that God said if you're going to do anything for me you got to fight the good fight I didn't call you to come into the church and sit down let me just be real tonight and tell you I don't understand people that sit in the church for 5, 10, 15 years I don't understand preachers that God calls them to preach passion takes them to an altar passion takes them to a prayer room passion takes them to a call of God passion takes them to understand where that call leads them and then all of a sudden brother French they lose the same passion that ushered them to the doorstep of a ministry I don't understand that you better remember my brothers and my sisters you weren't called to the playground you were called to a battleground I dare you to pour your neighbors uh, shake their neighbor and tell them you were called to fight and just in case you lost track of who your enemies are let me help you out a little bit today you got to fight the devil the Bible said in James, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he's going to flee from you. You were called to fight fleshly inclinations. The Bible said casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You were called to fight sin. The Bible tells you in 2 Corinthians, having a readiness to revenge all disobedience. You were called to, would it be all right if I just preach like I'm home this morning? You were called to fight compromise. It was one of God's own that took a Moabite, harlot, and began to commit whoredoms in the house of God. The Bible said that God in his anger sent a plague that killed, I believe, 24,000 of them. But there was a fighter named Phineas who said enough is I wish to God that somebody in this house would get an attitude before you leave here today that said enough is enough enough I'm tired of fighting the devil I'm tired of fighting discouragement I'm tired of fighting that <laughs> Phineas said enough's enough it's more than I can take and the Bible said they picked up a javelin and he threw it through both of them God I could preach a long time right there God called you to fight compromise. The Bible said he threw it through both of them. That tells me they were in the middle of their lewd act when compromise caught them. You better listen to me. We will lose some people who claim to be in the church because of a spirit of compromise. I've seen some Pentecostals shacking up with some pretty ugly things. But I've come today to remind you, young preacher, it don't matter who you see shacking up with worldliness. You've got to fight compromise. It doesn't matter who you see shacking up with a spirit that said we're going to preach great and not holiness you've got to fight compromise you've got to fight lethargy and indifference God said you've got to battle the spirit that's to at ease in Zion you sitting by a sissy right now elbow him and tell him he's talking about you Stay with me right now. Look back over the scripture. Did you notice that God never calls the sissies? God never calls the lacy drawer people. He, he never calls those that got more wiggle in their walk than spine in their back. God just don't ever call them people. But if you look back over the Bible, you'll find that God always has a way of calling those who've got a little bit of fire. God, I feel like preaching right now. <laughs> we marvel at Simon Peter, who seems to perpetually wade into the battle 
or he's ready to pull off uh, uh, the sword from his side and cut the ear of the high priest servant off. And then you, you look at it and you say, the man's just got a fight in him. I come to tell you today that is not by coincidence. When you study it out, you will find that all but one of the 12 apostles were from the Galilee region. That might not mean much until you re realize that that region was given as an inheritance to the tribes of Zebulon and Naphtali. That's important because their single claim to fame is that when God went to war in the book of Judges, he said only Zebulon and Naphtali stayed with me. And they jeoparded their lives even under the death. And it would appear to me that when Jesus walked onto the face of the earth, he took off walking to Galilee for one reason. I'm going where the fighters live. I'm going where the fighters are. I could only find one, one of them that was not a resident of Galilee. And his name was Judas. And he threw in the towel when the enemy put the pressure on. No, 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 no. You don't understand, darling. God's got a way of calling Samson's who can slay a multitude with a jawbone of an ass. God calls Gideon's who can take 300 and defeat a massive army. God calls Joshua's who can conquer Canaan's and David's who can stand in the valley and not fear the giant. And let me just utter how utterly insane, insane it is to say, I'm just here to worship. I'm just here to praise him. Do you know how stupid that is? They say, God called David. David was a praiser. I want to challenge that thinking for a minute. You say, well, you don't understand. God called David. Because David could sing and play the harp. I've got a feeling that God called him for a lot more than that. God chose him for more than... Listen, I've got a feeling God calls us more for the fight in our spirit than the talent in our hands. Could it be that saw something in David when the lion showed up and the bear walked by and God said he's a fighter and a praiser I kind of like that he's a fighter and a praiser that's right he wasn't just a praiser so God God loves me just because I come in here and worship I do my little two step for Jesus I got news for you darling if God's going to use you, it's because you got a backbone in there somewhere that stands up and says, I'll fight whatever i got to fight to have a move. Is there anybody at this place today, that mighty Russian wind that's got a spirit that said, I'll fight whatever i got to fight to have a move of God? You don't understand, Brother White. God saw him strumming his little heart. No, no, no. God saw him strumming the head of that bear is what he saw. <laughs> he, he saw him plucking on that harp no no he saw him plucking the whiskers out of that line's what he saw I've come to tell you today it's a winning combination when you're a fighter and a shouter too it's, <laughs> it's a winning combination <laughs> you know please be seated I think God chose David for his warrior's ability because God knew that Goliath was right down the road. And God said, you're not going to knock him down with a soundtrack. <laughs> huh? I don't, I mean, we can, we, we, you can get a, we can, we can sing another praise chorus, but I don't believe that bad booger going to fall for that praise chorus. <laughs> God said, I need a David that knows how. Can I just say something here? I believe that's the very reason there are certain individuals in the church that God raises up in every generation and he does it because there's a particular purpose for which God's called them to fight. I don't mind telling you, and I don't say this for flattery because I'm big enough I don't have to flatter nobody. I love Brother Mooney for one reason. I've watched that man in the last several years come alive with doctrine. There's something inside of him that's not afraid to preach. you got to be baptized in his name. you got to have the filling, filling of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. <laughs> I believe there's a reason why God... Well, God raises up people like Brother Mooney's or Brother Booker's who stand in certain arenas and they square their shoulders back and they're not afraid of the devil himself because God doesn't call sissies. God calls fighters. And then God anoints. Oh, God, I want to preach.
preach. He anoints them for that purpose. It's because of that that their soldiers made strong in a specific area. Is it not David who made the statement, Blessed be the Lord my street, who teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. He admitted that it was God that taught me how to do all of this. It was something that God put. It's just in my nature to be a fighter. We need a renewed revelation that God called us to fight. And perhaps nowhere in the word of God do we ever see this any greater, Brother Brosen, than in the life of Saul. Because the Bible tells us while Saul was still chasing his daddy's donkeys that run out of the backyard. The Bible said that God was whispering in the ear of a priceless prophet named Samuel. And he was talking to God. And the Bible said that God whispered in the ear of Samuel. Before Saul ever showed up, God tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, Come here, prophet. Now the Lord told Samuel in his ear, the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time, I'm going to send thee a man out of the tribe of Benjamin. His name is Saul, and you're going to anoint him to be the captain of the people of Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. You've got to see it. God said, I'm calling Saul because, oh, I would to God that we get a revelation of this today. He said, I'm calling Saul because he's exactly what I need to deliver my people. He's exactly what I'm, and just in case somebody doesn't know it today, you might as well realize sitting in this congregation that the God that knows all and sees all, the God who knows the end from the beginning, he stood on this terra firma and he counted the cost and decided this apostolic Pentecostal church is exactly what he needed to make a difference in a lost and dying world. God said, I need that kind of doctrine. I need that kind of preaching. I need that kind of worship. I need that kind of repentance. I need Jesus' name baptism. I need that kind of tongue talk. You're exactly what God needs. Don't, don't suck your thumb and say, I don't understand. It's just me and my little congregation. No, no, no. You're exactly what God needs. But my concern tonight and the premise of this message, that if, if, if Saul was exactly what God needed in his day, then how in the world do we make that hideous journey from being exactly what God needed to being a slaughtered remnant whose armor now sits in the temple of Ashtaroth? If we're exactly what God needs to reach this world, then how in the name of God could we make the journey from the passion and power of Pentecost to a useless remnant of warriors that were supposed to be powerful, that were supposed to be endued with power from on high? Don't get me wrong. I still believe in the power of the church. I still believe that this church is God's chosen method of reaching, changing, and impacting the world. But in the midst of our magnificent potential, I've got to preach to this congregation with an apprehensive heart tonight because I do know it's entirely possible for warriors who fight in a high lofty purpose beside us today to tumble down and become just empty armor in the house of Ashtaroth tomorrow. The scripture said that David looked at the situation and David began to sing the glory who oh Israel lies slain on the heights. How I think, you know, it's a sad thing when people play with God and fall away from the kingdom. But it's even worse when people have a high, lofty place in God and they fall in the midst of the heights. Fallen. How did he fall? He fell from the place where God whispered about him to a prophet to the place that God would even speak to him at all. He fell from having dominion over every enemy to becoming his own worst enemy. He fell from having power to drive out unclean spirits to fellowshipping with unclean spirits. He fell from being chosen of God to fight to being the dusty, bloody, empty armor in the house of Ashtaroth. And it was their way, the Bible said they published it throughout the whole land. One translation said it was their way of bringing shame to the warrior who had fallen. And it was telling the world, it doesn't matter how valiant they were. Are you listening to me preach right now? Would you wave your hands? He said it didn't matter how valiant they were in battles past. It didn't matter how mighty they used to be. In spite of how many enemies they conquered in their past. We've got proof that ultimately... They lost the war and I've come today to this congregation 
at the mighty Russian Wing Conference to tell you that there are some telltale signs that stand as proof when we as the Pentecostal church of this day and age have lost the war. It was God's warrior, God's man, now it's just a pile of bloody armor cast into the house of Ashtaroth. What is this house of Ashtaroth? It was nothing more than a temple built to an idol that stood in a land where it never should have been. It was sitting in a Levitical city that had been infiltrated with idol worship. And now this temple stands here to honor a pagan goddess named Ashtaroth, whose religion and claim to fame were built upon what her followers and history itself would call the three attributes of Ashtaroth. There were three basic things that her kingdom was built on. Interestingly enough, when you walked into the house of Astaroth, you could see how it was laid out. Because in this temple that they had built, a big square building, when you walked into the building of Astaroth, according to history, you could see how it was laid out. When you came through the back door and you looked at the front of this temple of Astaroth from one side to the other, it said that there was one huge altar where people would offer things to this goddess Astaroth. And all the other three walls, the wall through the door was in which you came, the left wall and the right wall, they said that upon each of these walls built out of stone that they would take these chisels and they chiseled out these magnificent carvings and sculptures that portrayed these three attributes of Astaroth. Are you with me right now? On the first wall, carved inside the temple, just as you come through the door, around that door there was carved, according to history, a door. And there was a finger stretching down from heaven symbolizing the finger of Astaroth that touched the prophets with great light allowing them to see the future. Around these lights were various signs and wonders and words issuing out of the mouth of her people. You see her first attribute is that she was the goddess of oracles, signs and wonders. Simply put she was the source of the power to foretell the future and to perform signs among men. And yet when you came in, if you looked to the left wall, there was intricate carvings on that wall, albeit lewd carvings. Because the second attribute of Ashtaroth is she was the goddess of fertility. On the top of the wall, they said, there was a statement that basically meant that loyalty didn't matter. The loyalty to a single spouse wasn't important. And it had all these, it, it was, it was a, a biblical day pornography, if you will, because you had all of these different carvings on the wall of the temple of Ashtaroth, of all these different sensual acts taking place. Uh, she was the goddess of fertility, promiscuous and lewd activities going on. Vows were vanquished uh, and promised. Promiscuity was promoted because the number of offspring took preeminence over any loyalty of relationships. And ironically, they would carry a child of their own and sacrifice it. They'd walk by that wall to take a child to sacrifice it on the altar of Ashtaroth up there, hoping that she'd have a, they'd have a greater number of offspring. The third wall, which would be on the right-hand side, had elaborate carvings of a fierce battle going on. You saw warriors with their swords drawn. You saw them slinging these swords, and they're fighting over these treasures of the kingdom. And it said, according to what I was reading by the French, the Ashtaroth! Just look over her shoulder, indifferent, at the battle going on over the kingdom treasures. And she would have her arms and her legs spread towards her lovers. We've all heard the statement that says, make love, not war. That was the third attribute of Ashtaroth. That's where that saying came from. Make love, not war. And it's right there, in the midst of all of that, that we find the bloody armor of God's warrior. This is where God's man fell to. He fell from dominion and authority over the throne that reigned over every foe to being nothing more than a pile of bloody armor in the house of Ashtaroth. I've come to this congregation to tell you today that it wasn't all that hard to tell when Saul finally succumbed to the struggles and lost the war. The telltale sign that Saul had lost the battle was when his armor, his ability to fight, was cast powerless to the floor of Ashtaroth. Somebody needs to hear this preacher tonight that when I tell you that it is entirely possible to leave your armor in the house of Ashtaroth. And I'm here to preach to you that regardless of how great a warrior you once were, there are some treacherous signs when we've already lost the war. You see the the premise of my message tonight is this, as mighty as God intends this church to be, we can find ourselves defeated if we ever leave our ability to fight in the house of Ashtaroth. Understand with me, I submit to this congregation tonight, that it'll be painfully easy to recognize the day 
say that we're rendered useless and we've lost the battle because you'll find our ability to fight surrounded by the ungodly elements that lie inside the house of Ashtaroth. I've come today to preach to this congregation how to know we've already lost the war. Just in case you don't know what I'm talking about, let me make it plain for you today. Ashtaroth's first attribute, the appealing door through which she beckoned people into her sanctuary, was the ability to touch prophets with light so that they could see and tell the future. Her appeal was the offer signs and wonders that made people stand in awe. As plainly as I know how to put it, the door to the house of Astaroth opened up through blatant sensationalism. You see in the house of Astaroth, sensationalism and not truth was the foundation of her appeal. And I've come today to mighty Russian wind to tell you the day that sensationalism and not truth become the foundation of our church. We've already lost the war. Please hear me. Realize the foundation of this truth has got to be, this, this church has got to be truth and not some hyped up environment where the only thing that keeps you coming to church is the flashing lights and the chance of somebody calling you out and whispering in your ear and telling you what you had for breakfast this morning. I am not against gift ministries, Brother Mooney. I appreciated so much what you said. I am not against gift ministries. I've been used in the gifts of the Spirit. I'm not against it. But I'm going to tell you, God's true church is built on truth and it doesn't be, it can't be built on sensationalism I believe in prophets that are used of God I believe in miracles, signs and wonders in fact I think we ought to have more of them in our midst and I believe the reason we don't see more is because too many are trying to make a sensational mark in a congregation and a name for themselves and they forget that it's not by might nor by power but it's by my spirit you cannot do with entertainment what God can accomplish with the anointing. Don't you walk out of here saying, Brother, I don't believe in prophecy. I believe in it to the bottom of my soul, but something's wrong when we turn something spiritual and impacting to the soul into carnal and appealing to our flesh. I had one old boy in my church. He had two speeds on his spiritual... Let's talk about cars, Brother Marner. He had two speeds on his spiritual gauges. He was either a prophet or a crackhead. He was either running all over my church trying to whisper in somebody's ear or he's out smoking dope. And every time we'd have one of these, and I'm not, I'm not against them, but every time we'd have one of these guys come through, they'd call people out, he'd go camping at revival. Brother, I feel like I need to sleep and pray in the prayer room, all this revival. <laughs> and there's some people silly enough to tell him, oh, come on. And he'd hound the poor preacher to death. He eventually moved off to go be with one of them. I want to tell you what the problem with that mentality is. He had no relationship with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. The only thing he could relate to is I've got to feel that sensationalism thing happening inside of me. There was no connection to the anointing, just an infatuation with a sensationalism. Hey, somebody listen. I'm talking about a spirit of sensationalism that creates men like Saul that can have murder in their heart and still fall down and prophesy and convert with a spirit of witchcraft and indoor. How, how, how? Because he'd already lost the war. He'd already hung up on sense. Don't get me wrong today. I believe in being all things to all men. But I've got to proclaim there's some try we're trying some new things that scare me. Now, I understand you've got to try new things. You've got to reach in different ways. We have street service. I've I got something going on today. We've got a big festival in our city. We're out there handing out water. We're out there doing all kinds of stuff. We've got a street rage trailer. We've got, we, we got a street ministry trailer. You pull it up. You drop the stage down. We can get out, preach, have church, and have the, the stage rolled up and be gone before the cops ever get there. I'm not against all that. But what I'm trying to preach to this congregation today is I've got a problem when we try to replace the anointing with the spirit of entertainment. I understand that entertainment is the king of this world. But God help us if entertainment becomes the king of the church. You don't hear me preaching right now. If you hear me, you ought to stand to your feet and wave your hands and love God. Come on, clap your hands. I'm not, I'm not here to be seated. I'm not here to take pot shots. I preach all over the world. 
But I gotta confess to you, my spirit's starting to get a little troubled because I've been to four youth conferences in a row, not even in my district. I've been to four youth conferences in a row where all the lights are turned out. And they got spotlights on the platform. And we don't have praise singers. We got four piece band up here rocking the house, head banging, and people up here screaming, jump for Jesus, and glorified marsh pits. I'm not against it. I'm not saying that it's wrong to try new things. But I'm saying I notice somewhere beyond all of that, there's kids that are just sitting looking. They're just sitting, just kind of staring. They're just kidding. Just kind of, I want to tell you what worries me. If we ever open up the door to entertainment in the church, I'm not, I'm not saying flashing lights is wrong. We have them. We just don't use them in a church setting. I'm not saying that updated dated music is altogether wrong. And it's not that I think they're doing it for the wrong reason. I think they see it as a method to try to reach our youth. I really do. But methods are designed to feed our altars and feed our pews and feed our purpose. But what troubles me is I see some of these methods become monsters. You know what the difference in methods and monsters are? Methods are designed to feed the church, feed the altars, feed the pews. But monsters crawl up to the table of God and say, you will feed me at the expense of the Bible. Said that God, that, that, that Jezebel called in the prophets of Baal to pervert the kingdom. She brought him in there to somehow lead the nation into compromise. But you better read your Bible close. It was part of the deal when they come in. They got to sit at the table of the king. Hey, somebody hear this preacher today. I'm not against your new things. But I've got to tell you, you can't not build a church on entertainment because entertainment's a monster that sits back and says if it's better singing somewhere else I'll go somewhere else if there's better preaching somewhere else I'll go you can't build a church on entertainment we're talented Yes, there's giftings among us, but God help us if we create a monster among us that gauges our services by the entertainment value. <laughs> God help us if we convince the people in our church that an off service is what happens when a keyboard doesn't hit exactly the right note. God help us if we fall in love with our talent instead of falling in love with the anointing. Hear me. I believe in excellence. There, babe, but there's always going to be somebody more eloquent, more entertaining, and more talented. But nobody should be more anointed than those that walk in truth. Nobody should be able to tap into the Spirit any quicker than those that walk in truth. We need to get back to an old-fashioned apostolic anointing that reaches deeper than their flesh and into the soul of man. And the door that we try to draw people into our churches with is surrounded by saying, if you come, this preacher will call you out. And we'll have 30 people on this side healed of this and 20 on that side healed of that. When that's the door you draw them into, you better be careful because somebody else is going to call people out. And somebody else is going to have brighter lights and better music. And then we've lost the battle because we tried to fight with entertainment instead of fight with the anointing. Would you clap your hands to the Lord and living? got to hurry. Please bear with me. The second attribute of Asheroth surrounded Saul's armor was that there was a day when they were willing to sacrifice legitimate children to have a crowd. And the day the apostolic movement is willing to sacrifice legitimate children to have a crowd is the day that we've lost the war already. She was the goddess of fertility to whom they would willingly sacrifice a child born out of a relationship in hopes that they'd get a bigger number of children. And the day you found yourself surrounded by a mentality that says, I think we can sacrifice the legitimate children of God. We can sacrifice a few of them gray-haired holy folks. We can sacrifice a few of them godly living young people if that's what it takes to get a big crowd. I've just come to tell you, brother preacher, that's the day you've already lost the war because you don't build a church by sacrificing legitimate children. You build a church by being loyal. You build a church by being faithful. You build a church by having a relationship. It scares me to death to see congregations and preachers that are willing to thumb their nose at what those, at those 
uh, that still stand for holiness. And this message, under the guise of we'll have a bigger crowd, if you'll let down on certain issues. No, 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 no. Why don't you realize that all you're going to have is a crowd? And that crowd can never become a righteous congregation. Because to become a congregation, you've got to bring them out of the world to put them into the church. Hey, the day we're willing to sacrifice those children of God that have paid the price and brought us to where we are today in order to have a few more is the day we've lost the war already. Saul walked with a mandate from God that said, to be in my will, I want you to go utterly slay the Amalekites. Slay man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and ash. You slay everything that breathes among the Amalekites. And the Bible said that in the midst of the battle, I don't know, Brother Miles Young, if he got tired. I don't, oh, God. I don't know if he got tired, Brother Mooney. I don't know if he just got to look at the carnage saying it's not worth all this. But somewhere along the line, he decided I don't have to kill them all. And the only way I can survive being out of the will of God, Brother Pettigo, is if I can appease the crowd by bringing a trophy back. So he gets Agag, and he brings Agag back home with him. And you know the story, how that Samuel comes and he said, Blessed be thou, the Lord. I performed that which the Lord has commanded. And Samuel said, What meaneth then the lowing of the oxen and the bleeding of the sheep in my ear? And tell me why you got Agag cowering down in front of you as a trophy before all the people. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here. I don't want anybody in here to be upset at Brother White. But I want to tell you, Saul sacrificed the will of God and got him a trophy to appease everybody else. Hey, Brother Preacher, don't you sacrifice the will of God in your life for popularity. That trophy's not good enough. Don't you sacrifice an unfettered pulpit for a new building, some kind of a trophy edifice. Don't you sacrifice the integrity of your ministry for a bigger crowd. If you're going to stay in the will of God, you've got to stay right. You've got to obey the word of God. <laughs> and we build these trophies. <laughs> I just feel this in the Holy Ghost. Let me preach to somebody here. If we're not careful, we'll build these trophies. We'll have these congregations. And we'll hire all this talent to come in to make up for the things that we should have done along the way and didn't get done. I've been in my church 18 years. I feel that building up three times. I hate when people tell me God can't do something. I hate when they tell me that. I filled that building up three times, and every time I'd get it full, something would happen. We'd have, you know, a, a winter season and lose 10, 20 people. I took out the pews, got 40 more seats in my sanctuary, all the time trying to raise money, all the time trying to get a building program going, all the time. <laughs> it seemed like, for some reason, we never could get the thing happening. I asked God. I even asked God if I needed to leave Brother Mooney. Maybe I just don't have the ability to do this. I pled with God. I begged God. I said, God, I don't know what. Brother Baxter, I did everything that I knew to do. And it just wasn't happening. And after some 17 years of being the pastor of that church, 18 years, I looked at that, that old building and, and the people had it packed out. We had people everywhere. We got more people sitting on the platform. We got people everywhere. And all of a sudden, I scratched my head one day and I said, I don't... I don't see an answer. I don't even see an answer. And I felt like a failure. And you know what? The devil would ride my shoulder and say, if you quit preaching against this and preaching against that, you'd get big crowds. You'd get money people to come in then. And then you'd have the people to pay for that nice building. I'm going to tell you, sir, I'm not a prostitute and I will not prostitute the word of God to get something that I can look at and show as a trophy. I made up my mind a long time ago. I was going to stay in the will of God. I don't care if I stay in this little building the rest of my life. I'm going to stay in the will of God. But you know what happened? We had a little wind blow through there called Hurricane Rita. <laughs> and Hurricane Rita took away my floors and my walls. She took away my carpet. My PA system was no more. I've been preaching off a guitar amp for over a year. Sister Rita took away everything we had. <laughs> for a year, I've been beating my head against a brick wall saying, come on, God. Let's do something here. 
insurance saying, we don't know if we're going to be able to do anything. We don't know. We don't know. And I'm saying, now, wait a minute, y'all don't know. We got me. And they say, you're underinsured. I'm saying, oh, God, help me, Jesus. But you know what? Just a few days ago, I got another check from the insurance company. And we're going to break ground in two weeks. And I'm going to have a brand new building completely paid for. Sometimes I hate tape ministry. And for all you folks out there, I wish you wasn't watching me right now. I'm going to tell you something. I've had people thumb their nose and say, I'm not going to stay where they preach like that. I'm not going to go. But for everyone that's left, God's replaced them with more. For everybody that's walked away and shut their wallet, God's brought somebody else. I wish somebody in this house right now that believed what I was preaching would make up your mind. I'm not going to lay down my armor. I'm not going to have a trophy. Hey, there's another generation coming on. And what's in your eyes is going to be in their heart. What's in your ears is going to be in their spirit. What's in your attitude is going to be in their soul. What's in your language is going to be in their nature. Fight, fight, fight. I'm going to come closing. I can't help but see the irony that the man who was so quick to take off his armor and put on a child, the one that was so fast to see the giant and say, I'm going to take this armor off and give it to David. I think it's more than just coincidence that his armor is the one sitting dust covered and rusting in the house of Ashtaroth. God, don't let yourself become indifferent to the things that ultimately matter in the end. And I close today with this. Stand to your feet, please. <coughs> the third attribute of Astaroth is the one where she just glances over her shoulder, indifferent at all the national treasures that are being carried away. And she's got her arms and legs spread towards her lovers with a make love, not war mentality. Closing today by reminding you the third attribute of Astaroth was love, not war. The day that this Pentecostal church surrounds ourself with an attitude that says our treasures aren't worth fighting for anymore is the day we've already lost the war. The day that we are content to look at the treasures that God has put in this church with an attitude that says it's not worth the fight is the day you're going to leave your armor in Astaroth's temple. I don't want to be out of line. I don't intend to get out of line. we got conference coming up. Bet y'all didn't know that, did you? Brother Preacher, bet you didn't know we've got some resolutions coming up. We forgot all about that this year, didn't we? Somebody the other day tried to back me in a corner. I said, Brother, what, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I don't mind telling anybody one-on-one -on -one what I think. But they had me in front of a crowd of people, and I knew there was an ulterior motive. And they said, where do you stand on this? And where do you stand on that? And my answer was real simple. It's, it's not just that resolution. Brother Mooney, any time that you've got people that sit in the church that can look at precious, priceless things, no matter what it is, no matter what it is. And they can say, it's not worth fighting for. That's the day that this pastor gets scared to death. Because there are some treasures in this kingdom that we better fight for to the day that we die. 
I'm trying to tell somebody in here, mighty Russian wind, listen to me. Anytime you can look at anything, brother, pastor, preacher, young man, the premier passion in my heart these days outside of my church is young preachers, but I'm going to tell you, you better get conviction inside of you. I'm not talking about resolutions. I'm talking about this world. I'm talking about everything. You better get some conviction. Because the day you can look at anything of spirit. Spiritual significance and say it's not worth fighting for is the day that we've already lost the war. Mighty Russian wind, the oneness of the Godhead is worth fighting for, Brother Mooney. Don't ever quit preaching this message. I'll never have the platform that you do, Elder. But do you know how many people that I hear talk and say, Brother Moody, reinforce my spirit? You know why? Because there's still some fighters out there. You're just tired. There's fighters out there. The day that we lose our baptism in Jesus' name, we've already lost the war. The day that we lose our holiness, we've already lost the war. And let me tell you where it all begins. When you let the enemy come in and carry away the little things. When he carries away your joy and you won't fight for it. When he carries away your peace. Oh, mission pastor, when he carries away your burden. And you won't crawl on your hands and knees to fight for it. When he takes away your convictions. And you're not willing to fight for it. We've lost the battle. Already. Can't you see him? He takes up a sword and runs into the a field of beans. 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 He's got a sword in his hand. And when the enemy comes, he goes like a madman, cutting and carving away at the enemy. And he fights so long and so hard, brother, that when the battle's over, he can't throw it down. It's just a field of beans. But you know what he knew that some Pentecostals need to realize? Today it's your beans. Tomorrow it's your family. Today it's your joy. Tomorrow it's your convictions. Because anywhere you quit fighting is an open invitation for the enemy to come back to your world. At what point can we look the adversary in the eye and say, it's all right. You can take my praise away. You can take away my burden for the lost. The day that it's not worth fighting for is the day, sir, that you've already lost the war. I have a tremendous burden for preachers in this building right now. The Lord has sent me to this house to issue a call to every preacher, to every saint that sits under the sound of my voice and ask you, is it too late? up a sword again is it too late to walk back to an unfettered pulpit and preach this Pentecostal message without fear or favor is it too late to run back to your church and say as for me in my house we're going to serve the Lord I'd like somebody to step out of these pews right now and say brother white I've still got some fight in me I'm just tired Maybe it's a whole mission pastor and evangelist that's here for the white. I'm tired of trying to have a move of God where they're not interested. Somebody in here needs to come. Pick up the sword again. You don't need entertainment, preacher. Brother evangelist, you don't need entertainment. You don't have to be used in the gifts. You don't have to call people out. You don't have to have a healing ministry. You need the anointing. That's it. Pray. 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 Come on, sir. Come on, sir. Don't leave your armor in the house of Ashtaroth. Don't leave your passion in the house of Ashtaroth.